Welcome to James Madison's Montpelier. I'm Ryan Nobles from NBC 12 in Richmond, and we're continuing our conversation on the Bill of Rights. Joined by Police Chief Tim Longo from Charlottesville, who's also an attorney, Hank Chambers, who's a law professor at the University of Richmond, and Peter Irons, who's a widely published author and the political science professor emeritus at UC San Diego. And let's talk about how the Eighth Amendment is practically applied today. And uh, let's start with you, Chief. How has the debate on capital punishment really evolved over the last 50 years, much different than it was a couple decades ago. You know, it's always amazed me in our adversarial system of criminal justice in this country where proof beyond a reasonable doubt is not 100%. <laughs> you know, and, and yet we're asking people to consider putting someone to death in a standard such as that. Now, that's not to say that the prosecution many times doesn't prove their case 100%. But that's not the standard. Mm -hmm. um, yet we ask people to consider um, uh, the balance of someone's life in the context of this process. And I think people are more thoughtful of that process today than they were perhaps 100 years ago or even 20 years ago. And the fact that so many people are identified uh, in our prisons that are there wrongfully. Mm -hmm. Maybe it was a bad identification. The vast majority of them are. And now they've become exonerated because of retrospective and crime tactics such as DNA. Right. And Improvements so that's, in technology. Yeah, I mean, that's changed the, the discussion dramatically, I think. Yeah. And do you think that's changed public perception, Peter, that there maybe not everyone that's convicted in a criminal court is necessarily guilty of the crime? Oh, I think it has. In fact, the number of exonerations, uh, which is increasingly, uh, you know, increasing over, over time, there have been over 300 people now released from either life imprisonment or, or death row because of exoneration that proved that they did not commit the crime, either through DNA evidence or recantations or faulty forensics, which is one of the most serious problems. But, and the public has slowly uh, and uh, gradually uh, diminished its support for capital punishment as opposed to, in fact, when people are given the, the alternatives capital punishment or what we call life without parole, mm -hmm. life imprisonment without parole, there is now a majority, it's a slight majority, but there's a majority who favors life in prison without possibility of parole, simply because people are now aware that there are innocent people who've been convicted and even executed, and that is a price that's too high to pay. Does it work on both sides of this coin, though, Hank, where we have uh, past cases where we didn't have all this available technology where maybe someone could be exonerated versus now we are investigating a new case and the DNA evidence can specifically point to some person that may make a jury more inclined uh, to allow capital punishment as a, a punishment? Yes. That, that is to say, in situations where you don't have witnesses and where all you have is the forensics, the forensics may very well make the case far tighter. Uh, and, and, that's a, and that's a plus. Usually the complaint, though, is that juries are, juries are looking for incredibly good forensic evidence when, when none exists. But I think you raise a, a very important, very important point that sometimes DNA can help us lock down uh, folks who happen to, to be guilty of crimes. One thing I'd add to that, um, confessing the fact that I uh, am a convicted felon myself and served three years in federal prison uh, for opposing the Vietnam War, basically, but one thing I learned uh, in those years was that the vast majority of people who were in prison with me were serving sentences that were far too long as punishment, particularly in disparities in, in sentences where one person would get three years, another person would get 10, another person would get 20. Uh, you know, judges don't like being forced to uh, conform to sentencing guidelines that limit their discretion. But I think that, um, for example, uh, a sentence of uh, 50 years for a crime that in most countries would only get a sentence of three or four years is far too much. It's part of this retributive aspect of the American society that we're still burdened with. And Chief, from a law enforcement perspective, uh, is there some debate that needs to be had in this country about the idea of simply punishing people for their crimes and then in addition to that, rehabilitating them to make them more uh, contributive members to society. Would it make your job easier if maybe Absolutely. we weren't just punishing people? It's, it's crime suppression that makes sense. It's crime prevention that makes sense when you invest money in reentry, when you spend time 
particularly toward the near the, the, the end of someone's prison sentence or jail sentence, you make an investment in them to make that transition back into the community a safe transition and a productive transition so that they bring job skills to the table and they have all the other things to, to equip themselves to be productive members of society. The federal government's making an investment in reentry, the state's making an investment in reentry, law enforcement's making an investment in reentry. As someone that was in prison, do you see how that cycle continues, that it's difficult to break? Uh, you may have already done something bad, you may be inclined to live that sort of life, and prison doesn't necessarily get you out of that, does it? No, it doesn't. In fact, in many ways, it reinforces it. For one thing, the only people you're, you're interacting with are fellow criminals. Um, I remember discussions people had when in, in prison of, you know, how do I refine my skills? You know, you wouldn't be here if you weren't caught in the first place. So how do you refine your skills? Let's say you're a burglar, for example. And that, it was like a graduate seminar. And the, the whole notion of rehabilitation, I'm all in favor of reentry programs. But from my own experience, and of course this was decades ago, but I think it's pretty much true now, um, what people need in reentry is is actual skills that are marketable in today's job environment, uh, not stamping license plates, uh, for example. There are not too many jobs in that field, but providing that kind of training. Uh, particularly with sophisticated technology, is very difficult to do in prison. Personally, I think that when a person reaches near the end of their sentence, they should be let out for at least six months into a real, real-world job training program. Okay, gentlemen, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.